He serves on the National Board of Directors for the American Legislative Co Exe Exchange Council and was the 2015 National Chair. He also chairs Alex Center for Innovation and Technology and is the Public Sector Chair for the Task Force on Homeland Security. In the Texas House, Representative King chairs the Homeland Security and Public Safety Committee and serves on the Energy Resources Committee. He was a full-time police officer in Fort Worth for 15 years and a reserve officer in Weatherford for tw another 20 years. He continues to serve as a colonel in the Texas State Guard. Seated next to him is Vikrant Reddy. He's a senior fellow at the Charles Koch Institute, previously served as a senior policy analyst at the Texas Public Fo Policy Foundation, where he managed the launch of TPPF's National Right on Crime Initiative in 2010. He also worked as a research assistant at the Cato Institute as a judicial clerk to the Honorable Gina M. Benavides in Texas and as an attorney in private practice. He's a member of the State Bar of Texas, serves on the Executive Committee of the Criminal Law Practice Group of the Federalist Society. McCron graduated from the University of Texas at Austin and earned law, his law degree at the Southern Methodist University School of Law in Dallas. Seated next to Vikrant is Representative John Ray. He began service in the Texas House in January of 2015 and is currently serving in his second term. This session, he served on three committees, Transportation, Homeland Security and Public Safety, and Rules and Resolution. Prior to his election to the Texas House, he served three terms on the Waxahachie City Council, including a term as mayor from 2013 to 2014. And on the far end, we have Dr. Curry Myers. Good morning. Dr. Myers has a combined 30 years of professional law enforcement experience as a state trooper, special agent, sheriff, criminologist, professor, and university executive. He's nationally recognized as an expert in criminal justice public policy, as well as organizational management and leadership, and has spoken at more than 1,000 local, state, and national conferences. He has developed and taught more than 25 courses at both the undergraduate and graduate level including disciplines within the criminal justice, criminology, organizational management, leadership, ethics, business, and in the humanities departments. Thank you all for joining us. We're honored to have you. Thank you. This will be a conversation, conversational style panel, so I will <coughs> present a question uh, to the panelists and then allow them to answer uh, as they see fit. We're going to start with community policing. Community policing has been around as a concept since Sir Robert Peel pushed for London to have the first full-time police department. Since that time, here in the United States, we have gone through the political era, the professional era, and the modern era of policing, the latter oftentimes synonymous with community policing. Given the strains in community relations appearing to be the most significant in this modern era, where do we go from here? Are there elements from the past that can answer our present, or should we look completely to the future and untested but promising models for improving community relations with our police? Dr. Myers, would you care to lead us off? Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm a Kansan, so we, we want to be like Texans. Uh, <laughs> but I'm honored to be here and, and honored to be up with you, you all, so appreciate it very much. Um, I think um, from at least my perspective, both um, as a practitioner in law enforcement and in academics and as well as uh, being the sheriff of one of the largest counties, uh, formerly the sheriff of one of the largest counties in the Midwest, Johnson County, which is in the Kansas City metropolitan area. Um, Overcriminalization seems to be the biggest issue that confronts us today in law enforcement. Um, when I refer to overcriminalization, if you can compound what is already occurring in the federal government with respect to additional regulations that are now criminal code violations, uh, a lot of the states and a lot of even the city governments will mirror some of the federal regulations um, that adds to the overcriminalization that even a local police officer may have in their respective jurisdiction. I'll give you an example. I was sitting in my backyard uh, smoking a cigar and having a scotch, which us former sheriffs, retired sheriffs like to do on occasion. And uh, one of my local police officers came and knocked on the door and wanted to know where the fire was. And I said, fire? And he goes, yeah, I had a complaint about a fire in your backyard. And I go, well, that's my fire pit. 
which was perfectly legal in the city that I was at. Uh, but as a result, he considered it to be an open, open uh, burn as opposed to a fire pit. And I was kind and put it out um, because I don't, it's not my place to engage with law enforcement at that time. I can disagree with it. Uh, but the next day went, went to the mayor and the, my city representative, we're a small town, and indicated my concern. And it is perfectly okay to have a fire pit, you know, in, in the city in which I live. Uh, but this burden of the EPA violations that the city now wants to control those kinds of things, all of a sudden we have law enforcement that's becoming more than just reacting to, to what I consider true criminal activities or responses. And that creates quite a burden to the public. The other thing that's occurring not only with overcriminalization, and that's just one example, but there's many examples of overcriminalization that's putting pressure on to law enforcement. The other is taking away officer discretion. Um, in my opinion, there's no way in the world our criminal justice system can withstand um, constant uh, legal uh, matters that are referred to the court. That's not the way it's designed. That's never the way it was designed in the, in the criminal justice system. The, the judicial system could collapse by having such a burden placed on, on that, the stress of that system. It's just not designed to do it. And I, I hate to go back in my day, but when I was a young state trooper, I had a lot of officer discretion at my capability to enforce laws or not enforce, enforce laws based on the circumstances that are placed you know, in front of us. Uh, the last concern uh, that uh, I think dives into all these together is the fact that law enforcement is continuing to have pressure to become sources of revenue. So with that burden for law enforcement to, to be that source of revenue and actually replace budgets or do what they can to replace budgets, uh, that's causing a stress between the community and the police officers out <coughs> in the field where we're no longer looked at uh, like firefighters. Everybody loves firefighters, um, and it used to be everybody loved police officers, but when we start to add all these additional burdens, public perception occurs, and the law of unintended consequences really has stepped into the public safety system because of all of the enforcement actions now that law enforcement has, has been burdened with. So it's a perfect storm. I think it's to the point now where um, we, live in a, we live in a country, the United States of America was judicial system was really based on checks and balances and we've, we've lost that importance of checks and balance and we've lost the importance of really what is law enforcement's function in America today. Mm -hmm. Representative Keene, you have an extensive law enforcement background and also the added uh, experience as a legislator. What are your thoughts on it? Well, all of those are good points and they all affect the perception and the interaction with the community. I think that uh, on the community policing uh, aspect of, of your, your question. You know, there's a, there's a lot of good models that are out there. I remember, you know, way back when I first became a police officer, we were talking about team policing and community policing and outreach. But what it all really boils down to is building bridges uh, before the flood comes. Uh, you take some of the scenes we've seen in, in, in communities, well, heck, we see them every year, uh, where there's uh, some major breakdown, riots, whatever it is, and, and they're trying to run in there and reach out to the local pastoral community. They're trying to reach out to the, they're trying to reach out to community leaders, and it's really too late. And so the concept of community policing is the same thing it was 100 years ago, and that's the idea of law enforcement building relationships uh, with your churches, building relationships with your business community, building relationships with all the informal community leaders, you're being at, you know, being at Rotary Club, being at, being at Lions Club, getting to know people before things occur so that when the crisis comes, whether it's the shooting or whatever it is, that you've already got a relationship to go to people and they know you well enough that they're gonna give you the benefit of the doubt and let you explain it from the law enforcement side and let you try to, to pull things together. We see things that, that we saw happen in Missouri and other places, once those things occur, First off, half the time they occur because there is not that relationship of trust and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and working together that's been a history of the department. Uh, but once it occurs, it's way too late. So the idea of community policing is really very simple. It's simply trying to build a bridge to the community at various levels so that when 
That flood occurs, that bridge is there, and you can cross it. Okay. Any thoughts on it? Yeah, well, uh, first of all, let me just say thank you for inviting me. It's good to be here. You may have intuited from my bio that I'm from Texas, although I live in Washington, D.C. now, and it's always wonderful to be home. And by home, I don't just mean Texas, I mean TPPF, which is uh, really kind of fosters a family feel at these uh, conferences every year. Um, I don't know that I can add too much more to what Representative King said. I really love the way uh, he described the relationship building. You know, you ask about community policing, we have about 60 people in the room, and I bet everybody would offer a slightly different definition of what community policing is. Mm -hmm. So it, it's important to try and get a handle on what that means. I like what you said about relationship building. What I'll add to that is I think it means police officers being proactive rather than just reactive. If the role of the police officer is just when the crime happens, go handle it, then you don't have a very good police system. That's not community policing. You want police officers to be a little bit more proactive on the front end with the sorts of relationship building I think that mm -hmm. Representative King was talking about. And as he said, uh, it's important to look back at, at older definitions. 100 years ago, you mentioned Robert Peel in your, your question. So Robert Peel is this old British prime minister who really gets credit for starting the first serious uh, police force in London. Did this in the 1820s. They were doing this all over the world. Here in Texas, Stephen F. Austin was starting the Texas Rangers at that time. But over in London, uh, Robert Peel was starting uh, the London Metropolitan Police, and he had these principles of policing, and the, I think the very first principle was stated as, the police are the community, and the community are the police. Mm -hmm. You don't want to have sharp distinctions between the two. You want the police being a part of the community where, as he said, they're at the churches, they're walking their beats whenever they can, they're developing relationships with people. And I think Representative King is right that in cities where the police officers have stopped doing that, where instead they're just sort of sitting around waiting for the phone call about the crime they need to go and respond to, those relationships and that trust is completely broken down. That's where you have a lack of community policing. Yeah, we have a, a lack of the community viewing them as legitimate. The legitimacy of policing falls prey to that. Right. Representative Ray? Yeah, I think these are all good points, and I, I want to build a little bit on uh, the concept of relationships and discretion as well, because I, and I agree, we could all have different uh, definitions of exactly what community policing is, but I think it's, I think it's the police force interacting uh, typically at the, at the beat cop level uh, with the communities and having the discretion so that when, when they're out there interacting with folks, they can uh, have that discretion and know who's just having a bad day versus who's really a hardened criminal versus who just needs a nudge back in the right direction. Uh, and they, the more that those police officers are interacting with the community, the more familiarity they have uh, with identifying the appropriate subjects of the police action. But on the reverse side of that, you know, the community also is interacting with the police officers and seeing that they're real people too, uh, they're compassionate, and more, more than that, they're fair. You know, they've demonstrated fairness uh, in their interactions with the public in the past, so that when we do have those floods, uh, as Representative King was talking about, the community has a sense of fairness, that the police are fair, and, uh, and that they're doing their job and they're doing it correctly. Excellent. Our next topic is militarization, and uh, this one's a little bit more controversial because there's good points to be made on either side. The militarization of our police is readily apparent and has been trending in that direction since at least the 1970s. Today's police officers have access to military equipment unseen in earlier generations. This includes MRAPs, assault rifles, and uniforms similar to our military forces. This militarization is often cited as corrosive to community relations, yet shows no sign of diminishing. Police are quick to point to the effectiveness of this equipment in assuring their own safety as well as increasing their ability to protect their communities from any threats that may present themselves. And several recent events show that there are times when this equipment is needed. Detractors would point to the use of this equipment to suppress protests or in situations not warranting the display of force such equipment represents as reasons for a separation of the police from their communities. Who's right on this? I'll let anybody who wants to kick this one off. I, I just tell you, I've, I've had a real concern about that. It, it, you know, historically we never wanted a national police, you never wanted only a statewide police. Law enforcement was always supposed to be a local function 
it's for every small town, every every county had its own uh, had its own agency, and the reason for that is is you didn't want, you know, nat if you look at other nations, I mean, one of the things that lead to coups and lead to things of that nature are when you have a national police force and it's all centrally controlled. So we've we've always had this this local level approach. You also wanted a big distinction for the same reason between the military and law enforcement. It's a completely different function. You know, we have people on the border, but our job down there, right now at least, is not to do immigration. Our job is to do law enforcement, which is to fight against human trafficking and to fight against drug trafficking. Now, they all kind of impact the same thing, but it's a distinctly different function. Uh, it, I, I get concerned when I see everybody with the masks and, and the heavy equipment and, you know, it kind of evolved from being police officers, things started getting a little more difficult in the 60s and 70s, so we needed some expertise, and SWAT was the big term, remember special weapons and tactics and things like that were the term. Mm -hmm. And so then initially you had law enforcement out there in t traditional uniforms, or you had them out there in plain clothes, uh, in, a, in, a, in a, what I would think would be a non-offensive way to the community, non-disturbing way to the community, but then when you had a major event, a sniper or hostage or something like that, then you rolled in the people that had to have the special equipment. Now we see the special equipment out there on the streets on, a, on kind of a daily basis, and it's, it's a little un uncomfortable. I think that, uh, again, it gets back to the community policing aspect and differentiating between, between military and law enforcement, and, and I, think it's, I think it's a real concern. You need those specialized units, and the officers need to have that specialized training to take down doors and the things that they have to do and run on drug labs and all the stuff that we have to do. And they have to have very, very specialized training for that. That is very military in orientation. But at the same time, your day-to-day -day interactions with the public need to be that police officer, the beat cop in a uniform that they're accustomed to that doesn't look like the military in the neighborhood. I had concerns with uh, even the National Guard during Harvey. Uh, my, like a lot of people here, ended up down there for one way or another. And I was down there with the State Guard, and, and we would have some military police units of the National Guard, and they were out there with, with carbines and things like that, that, that that's how they were equipped, but it didn't just fit just right into the community where they were trying to be there passing out meals and things like that. You needed people in an MP type function without question, but it just didn't fit quite right. And so you've really got to be careful about, about that. You bring up a good point that there's a, a visceral response to that when we start blurring those, those lines. LeCron, thoughts? Well, let me offer a, uh, a challenging hypothetical that's challenging for me, and maybe people in the audience will find it challenging too. I agree with everything Representative King said, and I'm very skeptical of, of seeing uh, police and military functions blur together. Mm -hmm. But what if it works? I read this really provocative paper by these two academics from England, and I can't remember their names. If people are interested, come talk to me afterwards, and I'll Google it on my phone real quick. They, they did this analysis. And they found that for something like every extra million dollars of military gear and equipment, you could get an extra 1.6% worth of public safety in your community. It's the number of crimes that would be reduced. And they really made the argument that, you know, we may be uncomfortable with this extreme militarization, but it might make us a little bit safer. And I read that and I thought about it and I went, but are we still done with the analysis? I mean, what other kinds of things are we losing? What kinds of legitimacy is being lost by the police officers? What sorts of uh, levels of trust are being lost in the community? Do people feel intimidated? Is that something we should think about? I got to thinking, what if somebody offered me the following deal? Vikrant, if we got rid of, say, the Fourth Amendment, I could offer you an extra 1.6% worth of public safety. <laughs> would I take the deal? I don't think I would. I don't think anybody in the room would. So it's a really difficult balancing act. You want the police officers to have the equipment that they need. You want them to have the gear that they need. Uh, but at a certain point, you do have to say stop, because other values that we really care about are starting to become threatened. Representative? I, I think it's a great segue from your first topic, because I think the militarization of the police really tugs at uh, the concepts of, of trust and relationship that that we're trying to build between uh, the police officers and the public through community policing. But, uh, you know, if, if you look at the acronym COP, 
and the uh, origination of that, I believe it originated as Citizens on Parole, uh, Patrol, <laughs> not Parole, uh, Citizens <laughs> on Patrol. Different, and, different uh, panel. Really <laughs> <laughs> yeah, classic slip of the tongue there. Yeah. But uh, I, I really think that we need to stay with the concept of, of the police officers being, you know, citizens. I think they need to look and feel like members of the community uh, and not like a police or not like a military force. Now, uh, with that said, there are certainly are circumstances where we've seen organized crime, you know, drug traffickers, et cetera, they're, they're sophisticated and uh, they have become more militarized. And there are certainly circumstances where we need to address that. But I, I do feel uncomfortable when I turn on the TV and I see uh, uh, the police officers uh, piling out of some type of armored vehicle uh, or wearing riot gear, et cetera. Uh, carrying assault rifles. It just doesn't look or feel right. It's, it's worrisome uh, for, our, uh, for our society. So I, it's a tough balancing act, but I, I certainly weigh in favor of the police continuing to look more like uh, citizens on patrol. Dr. Myers? Or parole sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was on a SWAT team for 10 years. Um, I've had friends killed in the line of duty, shot in the line of duty. I've been in a shooting. Um, it's certainly a difficult uh, topic because there's a, there, is, there are times when you need uh, to use people that have the talent and resources to take it to the next level. Um, to your point, I think it is true that there, it's not just the militarization, but it's the connection back to the community policing side that's very important. Um, if the perception is there that we are living in an overcriminalized society, if there's a perception there that law enforcement's used for non-law enforcement functions or what some of us consider non-law enforcement functions, if there's that, if there's asset forfeiture that's involved with, which is a whole other topic that needs to be really looked at considerably, that adds additional stress and weight and then all of a sudden you have law enforcement showing up with certain types of equipment in certain types of uniform and I think what's happened in my opinion is we've lost the due diligence of when a SWAT team should be used. Uh, and there really, when you look at it, there isn't very many national standards, and I'm not calling for national standards on things. Everything really is predicated on, on local matters. But when, when should you use a, a tactical team or a SWAT team? And the fallback is, let's go ahead and deploy them in advance just in case we need them. Uh, and and there's, sometimes there's reason why people do it if, if, if if intelligence is dictating that you have to do those kinds of things. But I think the pressure on, on society, again, is that we're reacting too quickly to a threat level that may not be there. And, uh, and it goes back to the days where um, you can be in a uniform. I was very proud of my colleagues in the Kansas Highway Patrol. I used to be a Kansas trooper, and it was about two years ago there was um, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement was in Wichita, Kansas, and they were going, getting ready to go out on the interstate to block the interstate. The troopers wouldn't allow them out on the interstate and block, but every one of them was in their highway patrol uniform. And they were, uh, they were talking to the public. They wouldn't let them back on it. There wasn't any so uh, signs of any SWAT teams. It was the one trooper, one riot, or one ranger, one riot type you know, mindset is I'm here. I'm here as a public servant. I'm talking to you. We are not going to let you on this, and, but we're here as uniformed police officers. Uh, naturally, I have my sidearm, but we're going to mitigate this problem. We're not going to let you on. And, and naturally, there was the, the, uh, the politicians also agreed and said we're not going to allow that to happen. Um, here's the thing. A lot of this is linked back to federal programs. So community policing, in many ways, became a federal program. Uh, if I'm going to have a community policing program, it becomes federally subsidized with some grant money. Uh, and then there, you know, the government may come out every four or five years with a new community policing program that's going to be funded and have law enforcement there to actually, federal monies are being used for that local officer to, to fund that program. In, in law enforcement, we have the 1033 program or the demilitarization program where uh, equipment that was used by the military is a federal program that actually can be, it's usually monitored by the state. Uh, in Kansas, it's the Kansas Bureau of Investigation. I'm not sure who it is in Texas, maybe Texas DPS that is monitoring that. But they allocate resources and the local agencies say, here's our wish list for things that we want to have. 
But none of that really would happen if we have, I'm a big believer in local control and law enforcement answers to somebody. Who does, who does law enforcement answer to? They answer to their elected officials. And far too often we give passes and say, well, the police chief or the sheriff, um, who are we to judge that in their wisdom? We're not in that industry, so we're gonna say, whatever you wanna do, chief, whatever you wanna do, sheriff, is okay because you're the expert. When in reality, it's that, it's that check and balance where sometimes the elected officials have to say, here's the community that we wanna have. And maybe it's, they wanna have a SWAT team, and maybe they wanna have a SWAT team appear to, at, at, at a moment's notice. But it's all about oversight. And if you don't have oversight, then you're gonna feed the animal. And it becomes a budgetary issue, and then all of a sudden, okay, you're gonna withhold budgets, and as a result, I'm gonna to go to the federal government program to get a handout from them because I'm not getting the, the monies necessary to run my organization as I see fit. So all of this really is tied in together yeah. into one package. It's not just militarization. Um, it's connected all together with a lack of oversight, a, a community perception issue. All those things are tied together and that, that kind of puts us where we're at today where there's a trust factor involved. And then you have if I may say, the federal government who continues to get bigger and bigger with law enforcement authority. Think of how many agencies out there that have 1811 authority or gun-toting authority. Special agents from the Department of Transportation or EPA or... Department of know, Education has Department this. of Education oh, no. has it. Uh, uh, the, D, the DHS is now a huge organization, a huge organization uh, that's occurred, TSA. You know, another large organization uh, that, that is, uh, you know, now become kind of a, a behemoth. So we're, we're hearing, you know, there's some instances where TSA is now at bus terminals and bus stations. And when's the leap at some point? Are they going to get on the interstates and be like federal troopers? I mean, I don't want to overreact, but if they're already at bus stations, they're, they're, they might be in other locations down the road. So all this is kind of that perfect storm of stress that is, you know, in the community with respect to the profession. The federal government's programs sometimes, as you're saying, allow a police department to circumvent that accountability by seeking appropriations at a different point, not through the normal channels. And, right. Um, would you say in your experience that what, to Representative King's point, that SWAT teams, while necessary and developed for a specific reason, that that's kind of really bled into a lot of frontline law enforcement, that it's all of law enforcement's become a little bit more militarized. Has that been your experience as well? Absolutely, 100%. Um, but you never know when a shooting's gonna occur. I mean, people make the assumption that I've gotta have a SWAT team to react to stuff. The shooting I was in, I was in the federal courthouse shooting in 1993 in Kansas. And so I didn't expect to get into a shootout when I'm going to court. Right. <laughs> But Curry's, didn't in have a shootout. Team with you Curry's in a shootout in the federal court. <laughs> so uh, you never know when that's going to happen. It can happen any time. But we are, I think we're jumping the gun some on the, the allocation of those resources and, and putting out those resources to say that's what we're going to have as a, as immediately out to the public. Hey Randy, can I tell a, sure. a quick story that I think is relevant here about why I think uh, these tactics and style of weaponry kind of bleeds out of SWAT and into regular policing. Trust me, I'm going somewhere with this. Sure. <laughs> I was on a vacation in Spain a couple of years ago. I was in this museum and I saw this really unusual gun from like the 1700s. By the way, I told this story in Connecticut last week, nobody got it. In this Second Amendment state, people are gonna enjoy it. <laughs> so I was just, just fascinated by this gun. It just looked like the most interesting device and I thought, I wonder what it would feel like to shoot that thing. I wonder what the recoil is like. I wonder how accurate it is. I just, it would be fun to use. I'm curious about it. I think that's human nature. And I think if you give some small police department in New Hampshire a bazooka, all the guys on the police force are gonna go, man, I wonder what it's like to use that thing. So they will take it to the local pumpkin patch festival every October, and this has happened. There are these tanks at these pumpkin festivals in New Hampshire, and it's totally unnecessary. But it happens because if you provide the toys in the first place, the folks are going to want to play with the toys. And I think we want to be careful about those kinds of incentives being put into play. Good point. Interesting point. We're going to change direction a little bit, and we're going to 
talk about arrests for non-jailable offenses. For those of us in Texas will remember this, the death of Sandra Bland was the result of a myriad of issues which included several cracks in the criminal justice system. Some of those cracks were addressed in Texas last legislative session with the passage of the Sandra Bland Act, which included increases in mental health training mandates for police and jailers and improved jail standards among a host of other initiatives. One section, though, which prohibited the custodial arrest of a suspect for an offense that was not jailable was stripped from the bill before final passage, removing most, the, the most immediate and identifiable factor in Sandra Bland's death. The Supreme Court's 2001 decision in Atwater versus Lago Vista made clear that such arrests are reasonable seizures under Fourth Amendment scrutiny, that is, an arrest for any offense, jailable or not. Is there a compelling government interest in allowing our police to take physical custody of someone for an offense for which they could not receive jail time even if convicted, or is the practice harmful to the police community relationship? Representative King? Uh, and, and kind of the most common example of that is someone gets a traffic ticket or they get two or three traffic tickets and it may be the mom with the kids or the guy who works at the factory or it may be the college student or maybe the lawyer, but they didn't take care of their tickets. And, uh, and they naturally they go to warrants. So all of a sudden the person gets pulled over and they've got three warrants for the stop sign and the inspection sticker and the expired driver's license. And because there's been warrant charges added to them, now they've got like 1500 to $2,000 uh, in fines out there. Well, they don't have the money to pay that, so they haven't been paying it. And so the police officer pulls them over and, the, and there's a warrant for their arrest that says you shall take this person into custody if you see them. So I'm probably off on my numbers here, but I think I'm pretty close to right. If you go to the Harris County, Houston, Harris County Jail today, I think they've probably got about 10,000 inmates and about a third of them will be there on Class C misdemeanors which are traffic tickets or some minor assault or something like that that either occurred in the officer's presence they arrested them or more likely there was just a warrant out there. And those Class C's don't even have jail time attached to them. The maximum penalty for it is like a $500 fine or something like that. So the question is, are you really serving? So you, so you pull over the, the mom with the three kids in the car and, uh, and the officer's got a problem now because there's warrants for their arrest, but they've got three kids so they try to call dad or grandpa or somebody to come pick them up, they can't get them, so now CPS is involved in that. And so then they get the kids taken care of, and this happens every day all over the state. And then, uh, so now they gotta tow the car in, that's another $250, $300 towing fee. They get to jail, they can't pay the fine, so then they end up spending five or six days in jail till the county or city decides they've paid their fines that way. And in the meantime, they've lost their job, at, at minimum lost income, and their car is getting a $40 a day added to it. So it's just, it's, it's a situation that's a big mess. Uh, we passed the statute four years ago, I guess, in Texas that allowed for uh, uh, officers, we never wanted officers to take money because that leads to a lot of problems. But, but we allowed for, you know, kind of the Apple Pay type thing where you could have a technology developed where the officer could make it as an option in the field for you to satisfy your tickets on a credit card if you don't have it your boyfriend or your girlfriend's got a credit card or, or uh, your, your father does or your mother and you can call them and do that. Uh, and there's some technologies just being introduced in Texas right now. There's a company out of Houston that former state rep Alan Fletcher's running that's really got a cool technology for doing that. I think that's gonna help with some of those things. But yes, we are putting a lot of people in jail that it really doesn't serve any community purpose when we do that. And those class C's are the biggest. The other side of it is though, officers make a lot of good arrests off Class C. I mean, the way it works is they'll, they, they, they stop somebody and there's a, uh, they, first off, if someone's fighting in public or doing something else that's a minor crime, a lot of times they need to be arrested. If you give them a ticket, they just throw it away and it doesn't solve the problem. And they need to go to jail. There's also times they stop people that, on a traffic violation and that leads to a lot of very drug arrests or other things. So it's, a, it's an important tool for officers to have that discretion to make the arrests on those but it should not be the norm of the standard because it's filling up our jails, it's costing us a ton of money, and it's really not furthering public safety and criminal justice. Representative Ray? I, you know, I'll give you a little bit of history. I've twice served on the Homeland Security and Public Safety Committee, 
And uh, I am a, I'm a lawyer, but I'm a, I'm a civil lawyer. I don't handle criminal matters, and, and I'm not terribly familiar with criminal procedure. Uh, but um, the first session I served on the, on the committee, I don't dis recall this issue coming up much, but last session we had several bills filed on this topic, and uh, it was included as part of a, a larger bill, but there were several standalone bills on the issue, which started to educate me on the issue and make me aware of it. When I first became aware that uh, you know folks were being arrested for non-jailable offenses, you know my immediate reaction was that sounds really crazy. You know we shouldn't allow that to happen. But after hearing a lot of testimony on the issue from both sides, uh, I ultimately determined that that this, although it should be rarely used, this is a tool that uh, law enforcement uh, probably needs and needs to you know they need to exercise it in a discreet, uh, reasonable way. And perhaps we need uh, uh, some additional legal fixes uh, to ensure that that occurs beyond what we already have uh, constitutionally or in the form of civil, uh, civil penalties, civil, civil remedies. But one thing that I recall from uh, debating it during the session was that there was general agreement, am even among the folks filing these bills, that police officers should still have the right to arrest intoxicated persons. Uh, on non-jailable offenses, just from the standpoint that if someone is intoxicated, their judgment is impaired, and if you don't, you know, segregate them from society and give them a chance to sober up, they may in fact commit some further crime or injure themselves or injure others. So there was, there seemed to be fairly wide agreement that that was uh, among the folks presenting these bills, that that was still something that police officers should have the right to do. But the other thing that, and, and Representative King mentioned it, is that police officers frequently will, uh, or not frequently, but it has occurred that uh, police officers have arrested someone on a Class C misdemeanor, that's a non jailable offense, but in the time that they're taken into custody and before they're released, they are charged with a much more serious crime. Uh, and uh, that Class C misdemeanor arrest afforded that, that window of time to uh, perfect the additional charges that were forthcoming. And that, that's ultimately, to me, I think a tool that, that police officers need to have. The crime? Thoughts? Well, I'm generally skeptical of, of uh, you know, enhancing the number of people who get arrested for low-level crimes. And I'll, I'll tell another story to kind of illustrate what I'm thinking about here. There was an incident that happened in the 2015 legislative session. I was at TPPF at the time, and I remember a little bit of the details of this. There was a member, I won't name the member, but uh, it was an African American from an urban community here in Texas. And he had a real littering problem in his community. And uh, it, I mean, it was a real serious issue with people just tossing trash everywhere. And uh, I guess, Littering was like a class C misdemeanor, and, and the police officers just weren't able to really kind of, you know, tell these knuckleheads, look, you gotta, you gotta stop wrecking our neighborhoods here. So he wanted to ratchet up the penalty to a class B, I think. And this would have, you know, made it a jailable offense. He could have had these police officers really get tough on these young men now that could take them into jail. And hopefully this would demonstrate how serious the community was about the littering problem. And what I want to emphasize here is that this legislator's heart was absolutely in the right place. He really cared about the problem in his community. I don't like to live in a place where there's garbage strewn all over the yards and everything also. And I get where his heart was. But TPPF's position at the time was, if you really want to create a situation where a bunch of police officers are having these interactions with young black men and dragging them off to jail for a little bit because they threw a Dr. Pepper can out the window of a truck or something like that. They shouldn't be doing it, it is a problem, but is that really going to be healthy for trust and relationship building between African American communities and police officers in your neighborhood? And I think those are the kinds of things, those are the unintended consequences that we wanna be thinking about whenever we, um, whenever we examine legislation like this. We really wanna be careful about uh, extending that kind of authority. Dr. Myers? Man, it's such a catch-all 2020 <laughs> on those. Um, there's, there's a couple factors that need to be considered. The, the first is 
Um, what's the expectation of the community for law enforcement with respect to arrest powers? Um, if, you have, if you have a criminal statute or something that's, that is at least a fining statute, but no teeth in it, then at some point people are going to take advantage of that and you're never, the system's going to be not, you know, constructed the right way. And law enforcement basically is going to say, I'm going to stop enforcing that because I've arrested the same person or I've given a citation to the same person 10 times and nothing's matter, you know, there's been no changes. Um, so you have that, you have that issue that you have to think about it. Now, if you're talking about the cop on the street or in the beat, um, I'm, I'm willing to say most beat officers know who the criminals are in their section. Is that fair? Yes. That's their job. They know who the bad guys are. And a lot of times that litter is because they're trying to get somebody who they know is a real bad guy off the street, and that's the avenue that they have right now to, in order to, to do it. That's, that's the reality of the game. And then you look at places like Comstat was, that was done, Rudy Giuliani introduced you know, Comstat. And the whole premise of Comstat was really the enforcement of lower level crimes because they did a study and most lower level offenders actually were ones who, who made bigger offenses. And they went over things like um, um, people who uh, littered, they went over squeegee operators and made them where they arrested and got them off the street. And it actually had the counter effect in New York where it became a lot safer community um, as, as well as other things. Some of it was holding law enforcement commanders accountable for their regions and things like that. So the, again, it's, it's a, to me it's an officer discretion issue. And if, if we're going to have officers abuse that, then that's the issue. But we, still, we shouldn't take away officer discretion because of some bad actors. What we need to do is deal with the bad actors and hold them accountable. And there should be systems in place in which we hold those officers accountable if they use bad judgment in a particular you know, situation, as opposed to just you know, remove that um, from, the, from, the, from the playing field to begin with. Because the frustration for law enforcement is gonna be, here's, the, here's another issue. You let somebody go that you could have arrested somebody on and they crash and kill somebody two miles down the road. Then all of a sudden we're bad guys again because we should have arrested the person. Um, what are we going to do with undocumented? I think we already in, there was an Indianapolis Colts football player that was killed of someone who has been in the system multiple times that, you know, when, when does it stop, where does it stop, and what kind of system are we going to have in place to, to keep those things from happening? If a mother is going down the road with her five children and a state trooper pulls them over, and she has a bench warrant, and the bench warrant is, for, is a failure to pay some <coughs> minor fine, the discretion at the officer at that time, unless there's some circumstances, ought to be reminding her that she needs to go pay it. Here's the court system, here are those things, that, trying to take care of that individual person. But there are people that, that the officer discretion should be, we need to arrest that person because of their criminal history, their background, you know, whatever that, that's in front of that officer at the time. So somehow determining where we can keep officer discretion but limit that discretion to outcomes that we Well, know, I think, I, I think the key, I think the key is we have to go back to train people again. Mm -hmm. the, the training of law enforcement is so important. Uh, training on constitutional rights training on the thing, going back to the beginning to say, doing scenario-based training, putting them in, in, in situations. What would you do in this particular situation? And then it's an opportunity to coach that new police officer, say, well, here's your opportunities to make a decision. Here's our suggestions on things. We don't really see that level of, of training. We're so, we're so, there's so much emphasis just based on getting their immediate basic training out of the way. It's things that are mandatory that has to be done. We're not focused on the human side of it to try to, to, try to give them better skills to, to cope with things that are going out in the community. And I think Representative King's point too is that the majority of these arrests are warrant situations where the officer has no discretion. I mean, it's a shall arrest situation, just like you're saying. So there is no discretion there. 
and that the discretionary use is probably less. And we can probably work with that in some other forms. That we well, I, th I think Curry really nailed it on the head when he talked about how you know beat cops know who the bad people are in their communities. So when they encounter them littering, but they're running, and they're in a high state of distress, and there's something unusual about their appearance or, or something of that nature, and they might make that arrest, using their discretion, might make that arrest for littering, but then while they're holding that person, they discover, oh, there was a crime scene nearby where such and such occurred, and now we've now tied that person to that crime scene. Yeah, we used to park in front of drug houses down the street from them so that we'd wait for cars to pull off, that and then we'd follow them, wait till they committed a traffic violation, pull them over, and this is really probably not appropriate, but we would pull them <laughs> over, write them a ticket for that, arrest them on the traffic ticket so we could search the car and find the drugs. I mean, so there's a lot of play that goes on and you're stretching probable cause a little bit, but, you know. I'm glad I don't have to answer that. Yeah. <laughs> Randy, just saying, it was a long time ago, <laughs> statute limitations. Me, yeah, but, but to, your point, the, to your point, that is actually, I mean, it's, it's done, but yeah. it's done because it's allowed and, it's, and it's, it is a discretion that can be used. There was probable cause to stop that vehicle. Yeah. There's, pro there's, there's probably, someone can ask consent to search that vehicle. Or if they have a search warrant, you can search that vehicle if you have impounding laws that allows you to do those kinds of searches or, you know, so there's a lot of different things, but they're tools that law enforcement can have, but it's really based on, on jurisdiction. Because if you have a crack house living next to you, you're gonna be calling the police every day about that issue and demanding that law enforcement do something about it. Would, you, would anyone here say that this is something that maybe doesn't have to be settled at the state level, but that might be an individual department policy where the community gets involved and says, we agree that this is a tool we want our police officers to have, or they say, uh, maybe not so much. You know, it's a huge budget issue because a lot of people end up in their jails that I mean, it is a very huge budget issue at the county level and city level, so whoever's running the, the local jails. Uh, so, you, you know, again, it, it, there's, there's two types. There's one where a warrant's been issued, and that's usually a ticket that hadn't been paid. The other is the officers break up the people fighting, or they have some drug paraphernalia or something else, they write them, a, and they've got a choice. They can write them a ticket or they can take them to jail. And, that, and the, the officer has to have the authority to make that decision based off, do I think they're gonna leave and start fighting again? Do I think they're gonna go do whatever they were doing again, drink in public, whatever it was? So you gotta have a lot of discretion. That's at the, at, the, at the agency level and the community level. But at the same time, when a judge puts out a warrant for somebody's arrest and says you shall take into custody, it's really hard for an officer to just let somebody go on that. Yeah, that, right, they'd be violating the yeah. order. Of the so in, in that sense, you've gotta have some kind of statutory authority to give officers some freedom in that. Randy, do you mind if I uh, talk just a bit about uh, Curry's point on uh, New York's example on going after small crimes? Because I'm with Curry about 99%, but don't go quite the extra 1%. I want to talk about why. Curry's absolutely right that, um, as you guys know, New York used to be an awful situation. We make movies about it, right? Escape from New York, Death Wish. It was just a <laughs> terrifying place to be. <laughs> And uh, Rudy Giuliani showed up, and he said, here's what we're gonna do to clean this place up. We're gonna go after the low-level crimes. We're gonna stop this stuff early. We're gonna stop, as Curry pointed out, the squeegee man, the turnstile jumpers, all this kind of stuff. We're not gonna let it metastasize into something really bad. And that worked, and crime rates went down. Here's the other really interesting thing about it. The number of people in jail went down, too. Incarceration rates actually declined. That's fascinating, because what was happening, actually, is that these police officers weren't just dragging everybody off to jail. They were getting serious about actually ticketing and paying attention to the crimes at the earliest level. Now, as everybody on the panel has pointed out, at a certain point, the tickets pile up and the people are ignoring them and then your arrest authority has to kick in. But if you're just serious about tackling the crime in the first place, writing the ticket and not ignoring it, which is what they were doing in New York for some reason throughout all the 1970s and 80s, uh, you're gonna have a real crime problem on your hands and because the crime will grow out of control, you'll end up having a real incarceration problem on your hands. So actually, I don't necessarily think that uh, you have to do so much jailing uh, in order to get the public safety benefits that you want, but I do think you're mm -hmm. absolutely right that New York is a real, it's a textbook example in a lot of ways of how you can have less crime and less incarceration simultaneously. Mm -hmm. I think they should be real proud of that. Yeah. 
there isn't really a nexus, in my opinion, to criminal enforcement and jail time. You know, I think I, that, that's, that's not, we shouldn't think of it in those terms. Enforcement of the law does not have to result in jail. And often doesn't, or shouldn't, especially if you have officer discretion. Um, there's a lot of time a stern talking to. Um, well, I was a young 18 year old and I was in a small town and I had an open container outside the bar. That's back in 18, you could drink beer. Um, and the police chief knew, knew me and came up to me and said, Curry, what the are you doing? <laughs> I got, and he goes, I'm gonna call your dad. And I wasn't a partier, I just happened, I don't know what happened, I had a weak moment and I, was, I had an open container outside of a bar. Now, in today's world, I probably would have been arrested for that and had a minor in possession charge. And that could have affected my law enforcement career, ultimately. And I'm proud of my law enforcement career. I was given the opportunity to do those things. So it, it again goes back into that over-criminalization where there's just so much that somebody is held accountable for and we don't have the you know, we, we have law enforcement now responding on, on playgrounds and arresting 12-year-olds or 10-year-olds for getting in fights. I Very mean, good. who, do, you know, right. I got in schoolyard fights. So, I mean, it's, it's once again, those are the things that, that are, it doesn't have to result in some judicial action um, all the time. Very good. Thank you all. We're going to open this up for um, some questions and answers. Uh, if you'll just hold on until the microphone gets to you, sir. Thank you. Um, so I think a lot of people would say that um, many of the problems like militarization or overcrowding of jails um, stem from the war, war on drugs. Um, so I want to hear all of y'all's opinions on, um, say, decriminalization or legalization, anywhere from marijuana to opioids or, or heavier drugs? Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll kick I it I gotta make a phone call. <laughs> uh, I, let, let me kind of go at it from this angle, and I believe I'm right on these numbers, let's, so let's go back to 1987. 1987, Texas had 37,000 prison beds, state prison beds, and they were all full. And so the criminal justice folks came to the legislature and said, we need to build more prisons. We don't have any room in, in the end. And so Texas went on a huge building program of building prisons. And by 2007, I was in the legislature by then, in 2007, we had 150,000 prison beds and they were all full. And the criminal justice folks came back to the legislature then and said, we, we gotta have more room and we need you to build more prisons. And so we said, whoa, wait a minute. We just, we gotta try something a little different. Uh, and it was very controversial, but what we did instead of building new prison beds is we, uh, uh, we, we went and took that same money and we moved it down to uh, pretrial diversion, pre-conviction diversion programs. We, en we enhanced uh, community supervision, pro, probation, drug testing, drug treatment, things of that nature, put a lot of emphasis on discretion for prosecutors to be able to move people into programs before conviction, do deferred type, type things. And so, again, that was 2007, and it's very, very controversial. And so then you go to 2017, and 10 years later, and instead of having to have had to build those new prisons, we've actually closed four and are about to close the fifth one. So the point is that we've been doing a whole lot of this and it really hadn't done a lot of good. Now there's a lot of people that need to be in prison and they need to be in it for the rest of their lives. They need to never get out. There's a lot of people, frankly, that need capital punishment and that's just part of the deal. But there's also a lot that we can intervene with early and jail really doesn't do anything but keep them in prison and cost us a lot of money and and nothing changes when they get back out, they go to the same thing. So what we've kind of learned, we've been doing a whole lot of this and hadn't done much good. We've tried a little bit of this and we've made some progress. So I mean, common sense says we need to do a little bit more of this and a little bit less of this. The same, the same time, I don't believe at all you should legalize drugs. I think, uh, 
I think that you look for common denominators of people that are in that prison, and, and it's usually uh, illiteracy and substance abuse of one type or another and mental health issues. And so, uh, but a lot of those on the substance abuse side and a lot of those on the mental health side, uh, you can start early with mandatory drug treatment, uh, mental health, uh, providing mental health uh, uh, assistance with uh, uh, close community supervision, training. And w one of the things that happens, so somebody gets arrested for a minor felony. You mentioned opioid. So somebody gets arrested for that one gram or less, but it's a felony in Texas. All right, so we want them to finish that, that deal, and we want them after that. We want to help them get a job, and we want to help them move out of their community because we don't want them in the same crowd they've been running with. But we've given them this felony conviction. This is kind of to your point. Well, now they can't get a job, and they can't get an apartment, and so we, we've thrust them back into the same place we, we were trying to get them out of, and they get back into the same deal, and they're back on drugs and back in prison. So there's, there's got to be a way to deal with those early on without a conviction, but at the same time, things that are serious crimes are serious crimes because they, because they are and, and, and often they lead to violent crimes and things of that nature. But I think before you start talking about legalizing heroin and cocaine and things like that, you talk a lot more about what can we do with early intervention. I'll guarantee any one of these people will tell you you can go down and pull the records of someone that's in prison today, and you'll see them start having, tr you'll, you'll be able to see the point where they entered, many of them as juveniles, into the system, and they just kept rolling forward and forward and forward. And there, are, there is intervention available that we can do at the local level that really has proven, we're closing five prisons, has really proven to work. So I think that's where the first step has to be in that before you start talking about legalizing cocaine or something like that. Um, it's a different, you know, whenever, being a college professor every semester, that's the first thing students ask of me in the very first time of uh, day of class. Um, you know, here's the deal. It's not the drug. It's not the use of that drug. It's the ancillary things that are attributed to the use of those drugs. That's the problem. If people could use drugs, go back into their living room, watch some TV, go to bed, I wouldn't have a problem with it. But that ain't the way it happens. It ends up, it's the ancillary, it's the criminal activity that occurs when you're under the, the you know, when you're under the influence of those kinds of drugs. And it's the, it's the effects of the drug that make you wanna do things that are illegal or it reduces or it increases the temptation to do things that put you in, um, you know, difficult, you know, positions, whether that's pregnancy or whether that's committing a crime or, or whatever it may be. So it's, it's not about the drug. It really is about the ancillary criminal activity and societal issues that go with the, as a result of using that drug. And that's my biggest concern, is I, I don't think we're ready for that. Um, it's just, but, but then again, I'm a, you'll have to forgive me, but I'm a little jaded, because I've seen, you know, I've seen it from a different, a, a different angle. There's no question that, you know, would we, have had pro, would we have had the violence in prohibition days that we had with alcohol? I can't, I don't know, probably not. But every day we have legal, we have legal products out there that there's a black market for. There's a black market, there's a significant black market for cigarettes. That's legal. You know, you can go get that anywhere, but what happens when you raise taxes on it, what are people gonna do? They're gonna find a black market so they don't have to pay some of the high costs associated with So you're always gonna have a gray market or black market that's gonna feed some habit or some desire regardless of what you know product that you're gonna end up doing. I just don't, I don't know if we have our, I don't know if we can get our arms around it at this point. Well, you know, I had a district judge tell me the other day, he said 90% of my CPS cases go away if meth goes away because meth is destroying those lives yeah. and, and, and they're, just, they're, they're just not being good parents, it leads to abuse and all other things. And so, yeah, I, I saw a presentation uh, probably 10 years ago, it was at my Rotary Club, local Rotary Club. I, it was very memorable because uh, there was a woman giving the presentation. Uh, she was probably 75 to 80 years old, clearly not a marijuana user, but she was uh, 
uh, arguing for the legalization of marijuana, and, and she was saying that it, could, it would be an effective tool to end uh, the narcotics gangs in Central America. And she gave a lot of facts and figures how they had, they, were, they had an economy, they were generating all this money that was larger than most of the economies of the countries in the world, that because of all this money they were generating, they had enormous access to weapons and uh, corruption, they could bribe folks, et cetera, et cetera. And she said 60% of that money was derived from marijuana. And that if we just legalized it and taxed it and regulated it, we would dry up 60% of their funding source. And here we are 10 years later, uh, and we have now um, made it illegal to, or, or not made it illegal, but made it harder to buy over-the-counter ephedrine-based drugs, which created this whole concept of smurfing, uh, which has now largely shifted meth production to Mexico. And we, we heard recently in our committee uh, from the DPS about the industrial manufacture of methamphetamines in Mexico. So I think that even if we had legalized marijuana, we've now created a much larger revenue source or an equally re large revenue source, source through meth production. And we're, we're still going to have that same battle of uh, you know, fighting and, and militarization and, and needing to arm the police to address those issues. because I. You know, methamphetamines is certainly a horrible, horrible thing, and uh, Phil's right, Representative King is right, about uh, the destruction it does to families and how it interferes with uh, child custody issues. So uh, it, it's hard to know. Uh, it's like, you know, squeezing a balloon. It seems to always bulge out somewhere unexpected. I think there is an argument for it to not, marijuana, for, for instance, not to be a Schedule One drug, though. That's an example where maybe there is a pharma, you know, there is a, um, a a use for that from some sort of doctor prescribed for somebody for cancer patients and stuff like that. So there there are arguments on what schedule a, a drug should be, but uh, yeah, I agree. Hello, y'all. Uh, Chris McDonald. I'm here on behalf of Republican Party of Texas. I serve as SRAC member, and my real job, I'm also a police lieutenant for a very busy municipality. Uh, a lot of what Dr. Myers is, is true and correct, in my opinion, based upon arrest for non jailable offenses. Good policemen use good discretion and make thousands and thousands of Class C arrests each day and night. But it's on those people that we believe are going to cause a greater threat to our society later on, your burglars, your dope dealers and such. And we will use our discretion at that time to make those arrests. It's unfortunate that the few of the uh, bad apples have made some mistakes and, and it ultimately resulted in things like happened and highly publicized cases that have been referenced here today. Uh, thank you uh, to Representative King and Ray on things that y'all have mentioned about uh, revenue. You know, we have laws here in Texas that prohibit cities from collecting more than 30 percent of their revenue uh, from traffic citations. Also, over criminalization, you know, we appreciate that you've got us out of the deal of uh, dealing with truants. That's no longer a thing that we have to deal with. I think something that we need to look at doing is reconciling our family code with our criminal code, which will help get younger people a second chance. Right now, as we know, age of majority uh, is 18 for family code, but 17 for criminal. So we need to reconcile and make it 18 across the board. That way these younger kids have a chance to stay in the juvenile system and continue to uh, be given that second chance they needed. Again, thank you so much for the diversionary programs that y'all have created, which allow our courts to uh, keep these repeat drug offenders and try and get them some help before they harm other people. Um, Representative King, you mentioned uh, the, the thousands of dollars that can get racked up by a, a person without money to pay their, their fines. That's a very unfortunate situation, but the worst situation that's happening right now is the uh, dual jeopardy that's been created by the legislature and the DPS. A person who gets a municipal fine or a traffic citation also ends up having to pay a secondary fine to DPS. And that is just a revenue-based driven system that's wrong. It results in these people uh, in a terrible cycle of trying to pay for their fees at the local level, but then they lose their license, so then they're subject to arrest, again, because they're driving without a license, but they're just trying to get to work. So we really need to reconcile that system and eliminate those fees, surcharges that DPS is charging for all of these things, be it DWI or Class C offense. That's what the first fine is for, and in my opinion, it's double jeopardy. I hope that y'all would consider that as we continue on. 
Other things that, that I see happen that y'all really haven't touched on that I'd like you, you to look at is right now nationwide, there are uh, legal groups that are going and attacking every state's bail system. Uh, they are saying that bail is being set far too high, that it is not right, and, and that has hit us here in Harris County to the point that now we have people who have been charged with murder getting out with $50,000 bills, and uh, they've ended up, as far as just recently, Houston Chronicle did a story where, sir, where, a, if you'd, where if they you'd got out there. If you'd phrase it in a question. I'm sorry. If you'd phrase yeah, it in a question. Don't, I'm learning something here, so. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, the, the statement is we, we need to bring, bring the two systems together for criminal and family. We need to eliminate the DPS surcharges, and we need to look at bail reform, and we need to change the messaging, because that's what TPPF does is messaging. Right now, we're being, being said that we're unfair and we're putting poor people in jail and, and setting bail so high that they can't get out, and federal judges have ruled in their favor, and, and they're getting out. They're doing more and more crimes. They've even, uh, our folks have even went to Los Angeles and were busted in an organized crime group recently doing burglaries of motor vehicles over there. Sir, I gotta ask you to ask a question. If you, if you're gonna okay. <laughs> What can we do to change our message? We need to ensure that our bail is, is kept at a, a good rate so that we can keep criminals in jail so they're not beating up on our citizens here. I, I've seen a little bit of the material that's been coming out about the bail issue, and uh, I, you know, that's certainly something that over the next 11 months I'm going to study and educate myself more on. But I, I have seen that that's resulting in some uh, unfortunate situations there in Harris County, so that's, that's certainly something to look at. I would make one comment on that, and I know in Texas it's, it's very strict with, uh, with bail. And in Illinois, as a police officer, I had almost unlimited discretion to issue a recognizance bond, an individual bond, to anybody, anything for a class A misdemeanor or lower, the only thing that was excluded from that was um, domestic violence. And we could release somebody on, on bond based on the officer's discretion, on, a, on an I bond, they called it an individual bond. Um, and and I, I guess my question to the group based on that question would be that, you know, is somebody who just can't afford a minimal amount of bond more of a threat to the community than somebody, let's say, who committed a larger offense but has unlimited resources. And well, that's one of the questions I would pose. Any, and thanks for your service, by the way, appreciate mm -hmm. it. Um, I think, you know, uh, the removal of discretion is not just at the officer level. I think that's, once again, a discretion at the court. Um, any modern criminal justice or, or, or even a, a county system is going to have um, anybody who's incarcerated based on a classification system. And that classification system is going is an important factor on what bail should be set at. And if the if if they're classified at a certain level, that would give a, a, a judge some understanding uh, to say we should set bail at this level because of the classification of that particular inmate. If they're a classification, and this is all pretrial stuff, so really detainees. Uh, but if their classification is such they're at this level, then bond shouldn't be. Sh Nothing should just be that's the way it is regardless of the circumstances, at, at least in my humble opinion. So it's that ability to have some uh, just judicial discretion to say we're going to follow the classification system of that particular detainee and make a decision on bailing authority as a result of that information. Like a risk assessment. And just, yeah, it's like it's a, that's what it is. It's just a risk assessment. You know, Randy, our, our questioner uh, asked us, how do we develop a better message on bail? And I'll, I'll give it a shot. What if the message is, bail should not be a question of how much money you have, but how dangerous you are? I think we can get people behind that. Mm -hmm. And that gets into these risk mm -hmm. assessments where we get a sense of how dangerous this individual is, not just what's in their bank account. Very good. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. On the question of uh, putting people in jail for uh, non felonies, uh, traffic tickets per se. Our county really struggles with that. I bet you it's more than a third of the people sitting in our jail, uh, which me as a taxpayer never made sense that somebody can't pay their ticket, so I got to pay the expense of feeding them in our county jail. Have we given any thought to doing civil penalties in this respect? If I don't play my pump plumber, you can put a lien against my house. If I don't pay my uh, auto mechanic put a lien against my car, and if I don't pay my taxes, I can put a lien against my wages. Have we ever thought about switching over to instead of putting people in jail 
for not paying their tickets to putting liens on their income, their property, to pay those tickets. So me as a taxpayer, I don't have to pay for their bed and their food while they're not paying their tickets. We've got probably time for only one answer. I, I know we're out of time. I'll quickly say that I do believe we have quite a few things in, in place that if you don't pay your fines, you're not able to renew your driver's license or get a hunting license or get a license to carry and that kind of thing. You can't renew those things until you clear up your fines. And I believe there's quite a few laws on the books which kind of relate to what you're talking about. Well, thank you to the panelists for joining me. Thank you. Thank you.